is and violence and how it was a gateway drug was not actually true. This was reinforced by the Schaefer Commission that was commissioned by Richard Nixon in the 70s, where they wrote a report that basically reinforced what the LaGuardia Report said in the 1970s. They were so convinced that the federal government was not gonna say the, the whole truth that they had a whole news segment that, that played during the evening news so that they could say what the report would say. And so I think there's a larger conversation as to how do we have conversations around criminalization and drugs, but we cannot miss the fact that the fact, the reason why we're in a prohibition state right now has to do with the government focus, trying to control certain groups of people, which is why when we're having a conversation around creating business and industry, why you hear people saying, we must make sure that this industry actually serves communities most impacted because the whole structure of prohibition was to impact this, these communities. Sandra just took us right there. <laughs> um, I want to follow up to ask, you know, how do we get away from demonizing marijuana and groups of people? And you talked about history. How do we write that wrong? And I want to ask you, David, being in the DA's office, you see a lot of cases. We did talk uh, that the numbers are there. It's been mentioned throughout the morning of, uh, of black and brown people being uh, prosecuted or arrested at a higher rate than, than whites for possession. So how do we write that wrong and maybe address some of the things that Cassandra mentioned? Uh, is there, it's is this not, yes. uh, that's a very good question. First of all, I want to thank the, the organizers here, and I just have one question for you. Uh, this is a marijuana panel, and I see that you're serving the world's largest cookies. <laughs> I see what you did there, uh, tip of the cap. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's arriving at a space where you begin to understand the history and understand the, the, uh, uh, the demonizing of, of the plant. I think that if you speak with prosecutors, whether you're talking about New York State prosecutors or you're talking about prosecutors anywhere in the country, our primary concern is, uh, is twofold. It's, it's roadway safety um, and violence. And one of the reasons why uh, there's been such an aggressive pursuit of these cases is to address uh, primarily those two concerns. Now, when I say violence, I don't think you're ever going to see two people who are consuming marijuana and engage in violence unless they're fighting over the last big cookie. <laughs> but it's usually the the protection of the industry that invites the, the, the weapons. It's the illicit economy that historically marijuana has, has been one of the primary uh, products that invites the, the protection, that invites the violence, and invites the chaos into these communities. But I think if we when, when we start to think about um, this particular industry, right? From my perspective, the, the, the reason why the impact has been so uh, pervasively in communities of color is because there, in communities of color, traditionally, there are no other industries. And so there's, we resort to the illicit economy because it's the only economy that is available to people. And I think that if we wanted to end the war on drugs, and if we wanted to, it's, it's a simultaneous attack of removing the product, removing the demand, but also attacking poverty. Um, right now, there are many of us in this state who are addressing the issues of marijuana by tweaking the policies that we have within our respective offices. So um, I think my, my colleague, Bill Fitzpatrick, uh, one of your neighboring uh, communities here in Onondaga has uh, changed his marijuana policy. I, I've changed my marijuana policy. Uh, so for the most part, we are uh, attempting to, with the current status quo of the law, uh, to address the issue, but the criminal justice system isn't really the system that you're going to find the, the kind of redress that I think is necessary here. I think uh, one of the roles that, 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 uh, that we need to play that we're enjoying uh, right now is engaging the governor's office. We've had a, a number of conversations and, about uh, marijuana and recreational uh, use. It's not my place to tell a state or to tell a lawmaker what kind of laws to do, but it is my place to provide the guidance and to 
alert the, the policy makers as to what some of our concerns are. The primary concern being roadway safety, access uh, for uh, uh, youth, and, and me personally as a DA of Albany County, and I don't speak for the, the association in this regard, I have a serious concern about uh, the, the social justice aspect of this and making sure that the people who we've been prosecuting on First Street end up uh, uh, being as equally rewarded as the people who were going to be operating these businesses from Wall Street. Under Sheriff Brown, hearing what some of the panelists have had to say just when we're talking about social justice and the issue and kind of the, the history and the context of black and brown people, and based on your experience in, in law enforcement, what are your thoughts on that? But also I imagine you have some concerns, law enforcement has some concerns about legalization of cannabis? So I was fortunate enough to work in the inner city for 21 years with the city police department and I saw what uh, what happens and certainly it is, it is not proportionate, right? Part of it I think is because there's more police presence in a lot of communities of color which makes needs more enforcement which is not a good thing. Uh, I think what law enforcement is really concerned about is in other states that have legalized that traffic accidents and deaths have gone up. I mean, it's a, the statistics are there, so we just want to try to do something so that doesn't happen here, right? And I agree with the district attorney that, you know, it's not up to us to make the laws, it's up, up to us to help enforce the laws and try to make good decisions with the law. So I think as far as traffic accidents, I think we need to, right now I currently have five drug recognition experts. So that means five people out of my parole patrol could actually test someone on a roadside and back at the office for being on an illegal drug, other than alcohol. And it takes a couple of hours. So we're not prepared as a sheriff's office that has law enforcement in this area to deal with an increased amount of drivers under the influence of marijuana, which has happened in other states. So we need to really work on that and work with the government, uh, governor and governor's office and on dealing with that. And right now we have uh, breathalyzers and we have tested that we can detect alcohol levels. We don't have that for marijuana or THC. So these are things that we just need to understand that we're gonna deal with. It's, it's a fact, it's happened other places, so we just wanna deal with them appropriately in New York State. And I think we also wanna work on not having the same effect of the increase in youth using marijuana that they've had in Colorado. So we just wanna address those issues here before we go there so we can help with that. I want to touch on regulation, but before we do, I saw Mary Cassandra shaking their heads no when we talked about. I calmed her down. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you for doing that. But you mentioned uh, traffic accidents and the, the the number that they've increased in other states. So that's actually what I wanted to ask. Does anyone have any statistics on looking at Colorado where it is legal? Has that impacted traffic accidents? Um, when we look at data from the Department of Transportation from Colorado, we actually see that there has not been an increase in fatal car accidents after legalization. What we have seen an increase in, um, what we have seen an increase in is the number of drivers who test positive for THC in their system. That THC in your system does not equal intoxication. We all need to understand that. But like um, the police officer said, we don't have a test right now that shows intoxication. Um, so, but what we do know is that fatal car accidents have not increased after legalization. So sorry. Mm -hmm. I would also say that you know oftentimes people talk about youth use going up as well, and we. I, I want to start with the conversation that oftentimes people see me as someone who is trying to remove the criminal justice, criminal legal system from dealing, being the responder to drugs. And oftentimes people paint that desire as someone who is not worried about youth use, as someone who's not worried about traffic safety. I believe that when we're having a conversation about public safety, that I am also a part of the public. You know, Mary is also a part of the public. So we are just as concerned, if not more concerned, about things like traffic fatalities or youth use. And what we also see around youth use is that it also has not increased, it has stabilized, and in some places it has decreased. And as someone, and I have to tell you that the conversation around education around this plant is crucial and must be centralized as we move forward towards regulation. We are also supportive of law enforcement being prepared for this new moment. And that, and that includes giving our law enforcement actors access
access to resources so they have more drug resource um, you know, recognition experts. These are things that are not mutually exclusive to the conversation around moving forward towards regulation. But I wanted to go back to something you said around stigma and how do we remove demonization. It is important for us to understand how much language plays into the role that stigma plays. We are having a conversation about cannabis. Other people use the word marijuana. The business community rightfully recognizes that cannabis is a term that has less stigma than marijuana. And so we've, the business community has moved towards cannabis. But we have to be very clear that even as we move towards cannabis, we cannot whitewash the history of how we got here in the first place. The very reason that the industry exists is because groups have been pushing back against criminalization. Criminalization and social justice has created the space for an industry to come in and be replaced. But that also means that when we're having conversations about markets that already exist outside of the regulatory structure, then we need to challenge ourselves and interrogate the terms that we use. Calling it the black market is stigma, is demonization. If we're going to have a conversation about the market that already exists, then we should be referring to it as the unregulated market, as the unlicensed market. Because the, 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 the structure in which that we bring this conversation has to fully extract the stigma that has created 80 years of destruction. And so having conversations about marijuana, the way that people are using, um, people are entering into the industry. The people that are still in the industry right now, yes, are breaking the law, but everybody's breaking the federal law right now too. So let's stop talking about those people as if they are criminals. They are currently operating outside of the market and outside of a regulatory structure. And yes, there are people that are committing harm and you know, they have to protect the industry space that they're in because there is no better business bureau and currently it is illegal. But every person who's in a suit right now that's standing in the back that is tabling for a business currently is also a criminal. And if you don't want to be called that, then let's stop calling the people that are currently in a market that has yet to be regulated, but we know is about to be regulated criminals. We have to understand that stigma at every level must be addressed. You can't make buku bucks and still keep your foot on the necks of those that have paid the highest risk for you to be sitting in this room. Thank you. you know, we just been sort of piggybacking off of what Cassandra uh, has just said. I think as a state, we're gonna get farther along uh, and we have the opportunity to be better than the, the other states who have taken the step before us. I think the only way that we can achieve that is, is if we're engaging in dialogue and not necessarily, so I, I can go on the internet, I have, uh, the people in my tribe, in my village, we have all the stats. And you know what, our stats are right. And, and people in other villages, they have their stats and their stats are right. But this isn't a conversation about the stats. It's not the conversation about who's right it's a conversation about what kind of community we want to live in. It's a, kind of, it's a conversation about what kind of state that we want to live in. Now, what I can say about the what I call the illicit economy is that uh, uh, we are not in the business of destroying people's livelihoods. That's not our choice. We're not waking up with the design to come into communities and, and uh, destabilize. But I want you to see the overarching uh, dynamics here, right? You have an illicit economy, and then you have individuals that, uh, uh, whose job it is to interdict in those illicit economies. And what results, because of zero employment opportunities, is the disproportionality that I think we all are very concerned about, right? But instead of having the conversation about what are we going to do to create opportunity in those communities so that we, we don't have people operating outside the confines of the law, we don't do that. Instead, what we do is we, uh, we're going to talk about bail reform, we're going to talk about discovery reform, we're going to be talking about all of these things that are criminal justice oriented and where we're completely staying away from those issues that, that are more pertinent and have a, more, a longer term um, result. I think, 
I, this is my opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of my association. I want to be done with with the uh, enforcement of, uh, of, of, our, of our laws on the issues that uh, pertain to, to cannabis or marijuana or however you want to refer to it. I, I want to be out of the business. But before we can get out of the business, before we exit out of the business, I want you to hear what our concerns are. Because the sheriff who's at the other end of this table, he, he wasn't saying, you know, marijuana boo, cannabis boo, law enforcement yay. That's not what he said, right? He expressed his concern about roadway safety. We don't have uh, scientifically established, uh, legally recognized testing for marijuana. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do to make sure that, that when this man goes out uh, for his routine patrol, he's not coming across you know, fatalities on our roadways? That is a legitimate concern, and that should be one that you have as well. And so those are the kind of questions and answers and dialogue that, that we have to have moving forward. It can't be about who's right and who's wrong, because I think if we are embroiled in that, then there's going to be a solution in the legislature. And that solution is going to please certain parts of our community, but it won't please everybody. And, and what you will have is an ongoing tension and dynamic that simply will not be work workable and will not be beneficial to the people that we're, we're talking about. Thank you, David. Uh, going back to concerns over roadway safety, uh, in other states like Colorado where recreational marijuana is already legal, I believe the Department of Transportation did a study in which 55% of marijuana users felt it was safe to drive while high. So I want to know everyone can answer this. What are your thoughts? And as we work through this, in terms of enforcement, how high is too high to drive? Be <laughs> cliche about that. Don't, don't and, thinking, and, and, and how do you even compare that? Can you compare that to what the legal limit is with alcohol? There, there, is, there, is, there is no, uh, Colorado settled on five nanograms. There is no scientific evidence that that is, in fact, uh, uh, impaired. Right? So they're settling on numbers with very little scientific fact. Uh, New York is going, that's going to be our biggest challenge in the state of New York. I'm going to say that again. That is going to be the biggest challenge in the state of New York. Because the only way that we can prosecute cases in the state of New York for impaired driving is to do two things. First, prove that there is impairment. Secondly, we have to tie in that impairment to uh, a public health law, a product that is listed in uh, uh, 3306. We're one of five states that's required to do both things. Most states, they just have to prove impairment. They don't have to prove exactly what was in the person's system. So now if you have um, uh, the regulation of, of, of marijuana, and we know, I mean, we all know, a person can consume marijuana on, on Saturday watching the UFC, and uh, be driving on Wednesday and be apprehended and have THC in their system. But you can't connect the THC to, you know, whatever the person was doing for the impaired driving. We can't take blood because in the state of New York, it's very, very restrictive, the circumstances under which you could, you could take blood. You can only get blood in the state of New York if there is a fatality um, and the, or very serious personal injury um, that, that is not a personal injury of the driver, but of someone else. In those circumstances, we can uh, move forward in the court and get a judicial order and, uh, and obtain blood. We can also get blood if, uh, if blood was drawn for an another purpose. We can get search warrants to get blood. But we will not have any means other than improving the, the number of uh, drug recognition experts on road patrols. Uh, or participants in the ARI a -Ride program in the state of New York, we will not have the means to address roadway safety. And I think that we all in this room, regardless of where you stand on the issue, have an interest in improving roadway safety. Uh, Sheriff Brown? I, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. We, we don't know. And, that, and that's the problem. Is we, how high is too high? You know, it's how, many, how many drinks did you have before you drive, right? The Mad would like you to say zero, where you're not driving if you're drinking at all. But we, we don't know, we don't have that answer. So I think that's part of the problem that law enforcement is trying to get behind is, how do we prove impairment from the THC and it's not from the THC? Um, how do we educate people that, so if we don't know, how are we gonna educate people about when to drive? How, how long they have to wait for their drive? 
So I think these are questions that we need to try to get answered to get the education out there to try to help with the driver safety. I think I have personally stopped and arrested people for driving under the influence of marijuana where they cause an accident and show impairment. And, and so we don't want that, right? I've also obviously gone to many a DWI crash, and, and so we don't want that either. So I think our, as we look at this, I think our goal with this is to make it on the same scale as alcohol, but how do we get from where we are to where we're going? We want to try to do as safely as possible for those out in the community. Cassandra, I don't know if you have something to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I. So I think, but you're already doing that. There, there is this idea that people aren't driving under the influence of cannabis right now. People are, right? And so I, I what I, what one of the things that I'm often like interested in, like talking to law enforcement about, is like, what is it that you're doing now, and what are the additional things that you could do? I think we have roadside safety use to try to figure out impairment um, and so what are the what are what do you think are the tools or the things that can increase because the fact of the matter is it's not as if people are not doing this right now and that law enforcement is not already addressing this thing I recognize that folks are talking about the increase in volume that this potentially could lead to but I'm very interested in like what is like it's not as if it doesn't exist at this particular it, it, it does exist in, in communities depending on what community you're talking about it's an embarrassment of riches in certain departments that have two or three drug recognition experts that they could summon to the scene. Um, but for the vast majority of departments, the costs associated with training you know, their personnel is immense. And so uh, you're, you're right. I mean, we're doing that right now. But in order to do it on a statewide level where uh, people can you know, have a measure of comfort and improve roadway safety, there needs to be greater investments uh, for law enforcement agencies to, to do those things. There also needs to be greater investments in our uh, New York State labs, and then, in fact, uh, testing needs to be done. Yeah. And we agree with that, right? We also agree with the fact that there should be public education about smoking and driving, right? And I don't think that's the safest thing for anyone to do, but I also am from downstate, and I don't have a driver's license, so driving to me is scary, period. You hear that? So <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? You keep driving. I'll, I'll be watching that. <laughs> so, every time I'm on the highway and there's like a car coming from a merge, I get really scared and my friend who's a driver just laughs because I'm like, it's coming, it's coming right now. And I was like, that's not how driving works. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think that there are, these are the kinds of conversations to your point, um, Theosaur, that we're, we are invest, the reason why we are on this position right now and that we have to move towards regulation is because we are invested in public safety. We think that regulating marijuana will improve public safety. And I know oftentimes people miss that, but I think, you know, there was a question from the earlier panel that talked about, you know, we hear you on the social justice stuff, and but why can't we just decriminalize? Decriminalization has been one of the biggest public safety failures in this state. People miss the fact that we have decriminalized cannabis since 1977. 1977, New York has been a decriminalized cannabis state for 42 years. Then how is it possible we still arrested nearly 800,000 people? 42 years. I'm gonna give you one even better. I know I look super young, but I have worked on marijuana reform for nearly 10 years. In that time, I live in New York City. New York City is a part of New York State. I know sometimes they act like they're not, but we are. <laughs> we knew that we had a problem. They were arresting 50,000 people a year in New York City solely for simple marijuana possession. I, people watch baseball in here. Are there any Yankee fans in here? Ooh. No. Yeah. no? Yes. I see you. I see you. He's got the shirt on. <laughs> To the Yankee fans, the seating capacity of Yankee Stadium is 50,287. In 2010, we arrested 50,855 people. We arrested more people in New York City than could fit in sold out Yankee Stadium. And we were operating under a decriminalization structure. Over 80% of the arrests were black and Latino. Now, 
we push, we fight, we push, we fight. Important for people to know, the decriminalization law in New York is that we remove criminal penalties for up to 25 grams for simple possession. However, if cannabis is in plain view, you're waving it in the air like you just don't care, or if you are smoking, that is an arrestable misdemeanor. I want you to know that NYPD admitted multiple times through operations order that that was not what was happening, that they were going into people's pockets, they were asking people to turn out their pockets, or they're arresting people because they thought they were smoking. And that's how we got nearly 50,000 people getting arrested. We, in 2014, New York City decides we will no longer arrest people for public view. In 2018, we will no longer arrest people for smoking in public. We will further decriminalize that as our policy. In 2018, New York decided, New York City decided, decriminalization does not work. It is the official policy of New York City that we regulate cannabis. Because we did decrim all the way to the end and it didn't work. And the fact of the matter is, is that I started working on marijuana reform as decriminalization. New York City's, my bio says in half, New York City's marijuana arrests have been cut by 85% because of our advocacy. Last year there were at least just a little bit over 8,000 arrests, but the racial disparities remain the same, if not higher. This is not a downstate issue. Monroe County has the high, one of the highest marijuana arrest rates in the state. I just, I, I just want to touch on what you said um, because I think it's easier if we think about um, decriminalization in this context as opposed to what we traditionally, how we traditionally do it. You know, alcohol is still illegal in the United States, although we talk about any prohibition, right? So, so how is it then that we can consume alcohol in bars? Well, it's a product that is basically illegal to possess, except our state legislature, our local towns, counties, have created uh, opportunities for legal possession and legal consumption, right? So think about a big box. And then when you're talking about cannabis and you're talking about marijuana uh, regulation, you have to start first by drawing that box and then saying, okay, under what conditions should we be making this product legally to, legal to possess? And under what conditions should we make this product legal to consume? And if you start there, then you can get good policy. But if what you're doing is saying, okay, we're gonna decriminalize, well, what does decriminalize mean? Because decriminaliz decriminalization obviously doesn't mean anything when you're talking about marijuana and, and having it or consuming it uh, in, in the open air space, right? But then it also leads for those of you who are in leadership in local communities to really get out and talk to your communities because you have to find out what is going to be acceptable in your community. So we can have market regulation, we can have decriminalization, whatever you want to talk about in the state of New York in 2020. But does that mean when you're going out to a restaurant uh, that uh, you want to smell it? Does that mean you, know, you want uh, people you know, at bus stop smoking it where you're waiting for a bus. Uh, so we have to talk about you know, regulation. We have to talk about under what circumstances is it going to be tolerable for law enforcement to effectively enforce the law, right? Um, and I just want to touch on one other thing before we move on to the next subject here, and that is Colorado. You, know, you want to take a trip to Colorado and just sit there and talk to your colleagues in Colorado about their experiment, because it is an experiment. You know, I left uh, Albany, New York with concerns, and let me just say for the most part, when I got there and I saw, I toured the grow industries, I toured some of the shops and spoke with regulators, chemists, um, many of the concerns that I had traveled to Colorado with were allayed. I was, I was really impressed with uh, with the, what they had achieved there. But then I was, I had different concerns coming back because there were things that they didn't account for. Um, and the fact that there's still disproportionate uh, arrests for people of color and communities of color there. And their, and their, their legal framework, right? Their legal framework within the state created more problems. And I think those are the examples we should be uh, following right now and trying to avoid those problems. Those co 
calamitous problems that, that, that this crop is not there by um, intolerable. Andy, do you have anything to add? Um, I just want to go back to drafting just for a minute. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times when we talk about this, people want to say we have to find a way to figure out how to treat it like alcohol. And I want us to challenge ourselves and think about how we treat prescription medication. We don't have this standardized breathalyzer for prescription medication, yet we have millions of Americans who are expected to be responsible and not take prescription medication and drive, knowing that we don't have a standardized test for it. Um, so I think even though there's the stigma about cannabis consumers being irresponsible, that stigma's not true. We need to put some of the responsibility back on the consumer and have it be a conversation about education and knowing that me smoking a joint and going and driving in a half hour is a lot different than you for someone who's never smoked a joint and goes and drives in a half hour. So there's a lot of conversation around the driving and it was really concerning in the CRTA to see the um, punishment for driving while intoxicated under marijuana increase to be equal to a DWI for alcohol when we don't have the supporting evidence to prove it as dangerous and we don't have the test. Um, so yeah, just challenge to think about it more as we treat medicine than how we treat alcohol. Thank you. The departments across the state. I want to touch on that, but first I wanted to get uh, Under Sheriff Brown's response to Cassandra talking about Monroe County having one of the highest percentage rates of uh, arrests in marijuana compared to other counties uh, in, in our immediate area. When you hear those numbers, is it alarming to you, not surprising, and then how do we correct that? Well, I think the discussion here is what helps correct it. However, I would just like to say, so I was a captain in section of the city, and I would go to community meetings, and in one area of the city, the, the underground market for marijuana was so prevalent that someone couldn't leave their house and go to the store without being stopped four times. And not all of those, but many of those people selling marijuana had the protection aspect of a gun nearby. So while I'm in full uniform driving down the street, I had somebody walk up to me with marijuana in their pocket and a gun right next to me to sell me marijuana. So that's the aspect that I think we need to try to work on that as we're talking about it's get, getting rid of that, right? So hopefully, and I think the goal is for this to help solve that. But I think that's what the, you know, we want to treat everybody equally, obviously, and we're not doing that. So we need to make a change to, to do that. And I think we need to look at, statistics are always a good thing to look at, and then try to improve when things are pointed out. So we need to do a better job as a community, and we need to, as we go forward, whatever the legislator decides and what the community decides, we need to work together to make it a, a smooth transition as possible to help as many people as possible. I certainly believe, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. One of the aspects that we find, right, is unemployment. Mm -hmm. So if we can change this to help with employment and now people are not unemployed and they're working and they're making money legally and I think somebody mentioned earlier one of the huge problems in California, it's a cash business. Can't have all that cash around and not have violence in the world. So these are all things that we need to talk about and work with. And I think getting people off the street corner because now you've given them a legitimate job has to be the goal of where we're going to go with this to, to help with that market that's out there on the street now and to try to do a better job than other states and eliminating that market. But I think we need to do this with our eyes wide open, right? So there's a lot of challenges coming up and there's a lot of problems and. Somebody mentioned earlier, right, we, don't, we can't wait for perfection, we're trying to go with good, we just have to realize that there could be issues with good that we need to address and try to address quickly and not get caught up in um, staying with what we're doing when, we're, when we see obvious problems. But it, it's amazing about the lack of research because of how regulated it is to do research. So it's hard to say these things and even say what level of marijuana you should be using and driving because we don't know. So you may have a tolerance to marijuana, but it may very well, just like alcohol, when you have a tolerance, slow your reflexes and slow your ability to make decisions, no matter what your tolerance is. The point is we don't know. So we're trying to regulate something that we don't have answers to. And so with that, there's a side effect of the, the problem of making this change when you don't know what the answers are. So it's gonna be, you know, there's ups and downs with everything. And we just need to try to get answers so that we know what level we should be driving. 
Uh, is it okay for one person to smoke a joint and drive a half hour later and another person not to? To me, that's counterintuitive. Could the facts prove out that I'm wrong? Maybe. No one knows. So we just need more on that aspect. No, I, I just wanted to say, because uh, you mentioned like someone like having a gun and having the marijuana, the stats that I'm talking about, um, if those would not be the stats. These are stats for people that purely had marijuana only, and so didn't have a weapon or anything like that. So I think that's important to, to state that the focus that we're talking about is people where they just simply have, they are simply just in possession of a small amount of marijuana. The other thing that I would say is that I'm very, very cognizant of the fact that, and I think um, Peter Soros would agree with me, that regulating cannabis is not going to get rid of all our social justice problems and our law enforcement problems in communities of color. So oftentimes, you know, when um, DA Soros says like, you know, we need jobs, like we have to talk about community investment and jobs, and you also said that from the sheriff, like making sure that unemployment that the group of people that are unemployed that are participating in this market, that they are, you know, incentivized to be a part of the market so we don't have to, that we can limit the gray market. I think it's important to also understand that in states like Colorado, where we have regulated, not only are traffic stops still racially disproportionate, but just stops in general are still racially disproportionate. And that is because Legalizing marijuana will not legalize black people. That's like, I feel like, you just have to know that. Like, because there's going to be people that say things, that come out here and say that they, come, they care about social justice, and that's why they want to legalize marijuana. Marijuana will deal with social justice. That is BS, and it is dangerous to communities of color, in particular, if you are selling these types of things. There is the stigma associated. It's not just the stigma associated with the the industry being illegal, it is the stigma associated with the color of people's skin that we have not dealt with effectively in this country. So even the conversation about how we move people from one industry to the other has to be, we need to have that background conversation because there are people, if we're talking about social justice and cannabis, then we need to talk about who is more likely to get investment, who is more likely to have the capital, who is more likely to get um, access to a business like this? All of that is impacted by the way that you look and what you were born into. And the other thing is that cannabis also, cannabis regulation also has big challenges too because if you look in Colorado, we have a major issue around displacement, gentrification, and skyrocketing rent. And that is something in New York where we have a huge 89,000 homelessness problem and we are having a conversation about universal rent control those conversations around housing, gentrification, community displacement also need to be considered into how we have conversations about cannabis regulation and businesses because that, the conversation around social justice is not just about who gets licenses, it's not just about policing, but how is cannabis regulation feeding into a thriving community and not creating newer problems or exacerbating problems that are underlying based on the way that this country has a real hard time dealing with poor people and dealing with women and dealing with people of color. Yes, sir. I just think that some of the some of the issues that Cassandra raises really demonstrates the complexity of, 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 of what uh, we're experiencing. And, uh, my conversations with Alex in the past when governor's legislation, you start to talk through these issues and it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier and your face just hits the, uh, the, the table. And I think what we're trying, I think what we're trying to do, and I think people think about it along those lines, is that we're trying to create this robust piece of legislation that's going to cure all of these issues. And let me just say that if that's our goal, then we will fail and fail miserably. Uh, we have to start somewhere. And then we, we have to take into consideration all of these concerns and incorporate those concerns as we move as we move forward. I, I would just, and I'll leave it at this in terms of my comment. You know, anytime anyone mentions, you know, 1861 in the context of uh, the state's rights, it conjures up a whole host of terrible, terrible images for, for people of color, especially with me knowing what the Civil War was about. It was about the subjugation of, of 
of human beings. And we had states after the Louisiana Purchase that wanted to continue that. And um, those states you know, were willing to secede from the Union in order to have what they call states' rights. And federalism in that case, I think we can all agree that federalism was very good then, right? So I don't like to use the worst case example of, of states' rights and federalism to make the argument that states should be able to regulate uh, its own industry. So, but I do draw from some lessons of the Civil War, and that's Reconstruction. And just imagine what Reconstruction in the lives of, of, of people of color would have would be like today if, in fact, Abraham Lincoln's vision of Reconstruction were to take place, and instead of him being assassinated, we had someone like Andrew Johnson come along and just destroy that. Reconstruction today uh, with marijuana regulation means that we're going into those very communities that, would, that have been destroyed as a result of interdiction and engaging that community, not only to give people uh, liberty, as, as was the case for those formerly subjugated, but to give you know, voting rights for those people who uh, were previously convicted and now are uh, paid their debt to society and are living in these communities give people economic opportunities um, to, to own land. <laughs> you know, there's so many similarities to be drawn from the experiences of, of ending that war. Um, so if you don't like to think of it in terms of reconstruction, you should think about it in terms of the Marshall Plan, which, as you know, after World War II, when they ended that war, um, you know, the victors began to rebuild the nations of those people that had lost. And I don't think there's anybody, anyone on planet Earth that can make uh, the argument that the Marshall Plan, going in and rebuilding the nations of our, our, of our enemies and rebuilding the lives of our enemies, I don't think anyone can make the argument that that hasn't been a success for us. And those of you who are in industry, who are looking to develop a robust economy, let me just say this. You are not going to be able to succeed in your business unless you are first and foremost concerned about what is happening to those people who We've been prosecuting historically uh, in this country. Your business will flourish if you're giving thought to them because Colorado is the example. When they barred people with criminal histories from entry, all that did was it signaled you know, uh, to the illicit economy that, boy, we could really be making much more money because those guys over there are being over-regulated, they're being overtaxed, and we could sell what they're, what they're selling for one-third of the price. So please, as, as those of you who are considering your own entry into the industry, uh, if, you're, if you're not thinking about social justice, marijuana Marshall Plan, then you are undermining yourself. I did want to be able to take one question from the audience. Uh, and this question is, what happens to drug testing of employers? Something to think about. Oh yeah, we have thought about it. Um, <laughs> so uh, not sure how much uh, people have seen but we have, and also want to mention, we talked about federal legislation um, a bunch, oftentimes, and it was very interesting that the Marijuana Justice Act was not brought up, which is the legislation that Cory Booker um, introduced that is uh, pretty much very similar. It is born out of uh, the Marijuana Regulation Taxation Act that uh, Assembly Member um, Crystal Peoples folks and Senator Liz Kruger introduced here. So I just want folks to, um, know that the Marijuana Justice Act has been introduced at the federal level and is reflective of a comprehensive solution to really centering the criminalization of prohibition. Um, one of the things that we've done um, in uh, New York City is work with our city council to actually take on the collateral consequences. And one of the bills that passed and got a lot of, um, a lot of attention was the fact that in New York City, the position is that they will no longer um, allow uh, employers to test for marijuana, except in certain jobs that have high risk for vulnerable impairment and pretty dangerous to people on the job. But for other things, that that should not um, be taken into consideration. And so part of the thing is that you don't, if we are regulating a substance and we're not testing people for alcohol, what people do in their private lives outside of being at work um, should not impede them from having a job or passing a background test. Now, the conversation, oftentimes we are questioning like, well, what about if people are high at work? And it's like, those rules already exist. 
people shouldn't be high at work, just like people shouldn't be drunk at work, right? So like those, none of the things that we are doing around drug testing um, are trying to disrupt the, the ways that people need to operate. What we're trying to do is give people more space and autonomy in their private lives um, as the whole country and the state is moving towards regulation and trying to bring it into accordance with the rules for other substances as well. Any final thoughts? We gotta keep this moving, but I knew we were gonna engage in some good dialogue here, and we did. I have a whole list of questions I didn't even get to still. Any final thoughts on, on social justice and law enforcement? Um, my final thoughts are I'd like to commend the cities in New York that have taken the initiative to put forward, either mayor is putting forward an executive order to deprioritize low-level marijuana arrests, and to district attorneys that have called to stop prosecuting for those same offenses. Um, at the same time, I'm sure a lot of folks sitting here in this room are from the city of Rochester or Monroe County, and we've done neither of those things. So if anyone wants to leave here and call Mayor Lovely Warren or District Attorney Sandra Dorley and encourage them to take that action, um, our organization has met with both of them and put all of this information in front of their face, and now we need the voice of the community to help us and to really make some action happen. I, I just want to add that I think the most important thing in the, is communication, right? No matter where you lay on this issue, no matter what your ideas are on it, we're, we're going to go in a direction. Let's communicate through that direction. And even if you disagree with somebody, we still need to have these conversations because you learn things from that. And so on both sides. And so we just need to continue to work together and go with our eyes wide open that there's issues either way. So let's do the best we can and fix what we can and keep people as safe as we can. Yes, or else, final word. Yeah, you just stole my, my words in addition to my seat. Um, <laughs> Cassandra, Cassandra and I are, I, I are really, really, really great friends. Um, don't always agree when she texts me, she wants to see me in Albany. I know I gotta, I know I gotta have my Starbucks and, uh, uh, but you know what? I have to say that I cherish our relationship um, and I've learned so much from her. She's enlightened me, but you know, part of the reason that I have the policy that I have is because of that education that you keep uh, providing. So for Mary, I, I would tell you that in the case of Sandra and, and your other leadership here, don't give up on them, continue to dialogue with them um, because I think it will benefit you all. I thank you to all of you here. Give them a round of applause.